If you're listening on podcast, be sure to tune in to our YouTube channel for more content. The link is in the description. Welcome to Wild and Weird Radio, a Wild and Weird West Virginia podcast. Join us for this very special edition of Wild and Weird Radio as we celebrate our 100th episode with legendary author and researcher Stan Gordon. Stan will be going over some of his past research as well as some of the stories and accounts in his latest book. For those who are watching on YouTube, be sure to stay tuned for the bonus footage at the end of this episode. For those who haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do so. It's completely free, and plus you will not miss out on any future content, such as the news special report, which we dropped this week. Welcome back to Wild and Weird Radio for the 100th time. That's right, guys. That's the big one double zero, and this is our episode that uh technically is kind of like our two-year anniversary episode because that was actually yeah. last week's episode but we completely yeah. forgot yeah we completely forgot our own uh <laughs> milestone so we really are so obsessed with ourselves. <laughs> so uh so ron how's things going everything's going great on our end we're getting ready for obc and we have a few other little things going on we got a little thing going on with dave and there, there's all kinds of stuff happening just Watch your calendar, right? I mean, that's yeah, that's it. that's the thing is just watch the calendar, and yeah. and now all the weather craziness is out of the way, so it shouldn't yes. be, shouldn't be any issues on that front. Jesse, how's things going with you guys? Things are going really good. Our channel is doing very well right now. Uh, it's getting a lot of steam, and um, I am hammering away at new videos, hammering away at the uh, part two of my LBL investigation. Um, so, but yeah, everything's going very well. Uh, we're having a great time and awesome. everything's just trucking along. That is yeah. awesome. Like it, it's so exciting watching everything go on over there at Helmet Holler. It is an absolute trip. It is. But it's all, it's all so well earned that it, it's just, you can't help but be happy. Thank you. But, um, well, I, I hear that, uh, since this is the hundredth episode and all, we, we've actually got a, yeah. uh, a special guest. We have a is special that, guest for yes, for the 100th episode. We we absolutely have a special guest and uh, a guest and author. Um, and you might know the guy. Uh, it's down here at the bottom. It's right there. It's it's, it's this guy. This guy. <laughs> Stan that guy. The man. <laughs> Gordon. It's this guy. <laughs> hey Stan, how are you doing? Hi Ron, we're doing great. How are you folks all doing? Oh, oh wonderful. Can't complain. I'm on this side of the dirt, so it's a good day. Always a good day. Always. That's, that's a good thing to hear. I'm glad that uh, things are starting to turn around, and hopefully we'll all be able to get out and enjoy a lot more events. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, so Stan, you we've had you here with us before. Um, what's new in your neck of the woods, my friend? Well, it's been extremely busy. Uh, since, I mean, we, on occasion we, we get to talk and uh, things have been going on. But, you know, as we mentioned, there's some of the information on my website. The, the last two years has been really just steady with reports. And uh, some years are even a little more than others. And uh, last year, 2021, there were reports coming through every month of the year, all year long. But then what really got really intriguing is, and I'm sure you fellows recognize this as well, but generally – UFO sightings in particular, they, they generally begin to slow down in the in the fall and winter months when the weather's getting uh, bad and cold, and that's normal. But but 
Last year, it didn't happen that way. In October, we began to, to see a surge in, in a lot of UFO reports, but these were not high-level lights in the sky. A lot of these reports coming in are low-level objects uh, low to the ground, in some cases very close, and, and a lot of these are solid objects it's been really intriguing, and this series of events has been ongoing, and again, surprisingly, right through the early, this year, right into January, and right through the last couple of weeks, and it's just been steady reports coming in. And, and while it, a lot of it's UFO activity, there has been um, some cryptid activity being reported. Um, it's just amazing what's going on. And in fact, last well, was about, what is it now, two weeks, almost two weeks ago on Thursday afternoon, uh, beautiful afternoon. Uh, I now have independent reports here in Westmoreland County. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail yet because I'm still hoping to get other independent witnesses and give me the same details. But these people, reports that came in, uh, reports I got from uh, another source as well, indicate it was probably very likely the same object. This is one low-level, very large, solid object with multiple lights on it at treetop level in the same area. And a uh, really interesting report. And, of course, we're, we're getting some other reports of what we've talked about with what I call mini UFOs I investigated since the 1960s. And um, these are, again, generally these small, of course, some people would refer them as the orbs, but uh, small, generally spherical objects, but not always round, but most of the time they are. And they range anywhere from a couple of inches, so they look almost like large, overgrown, fireflies or lightning bugs very commonly these things are about one to two feet in diameter uh sometimes a little bit bigger but they're either solid metallic or they're just bright light sources of various colors but what's so interesting is these are not high altitude these are not high in the sky these objects are low to the ground sometimes at tree level sometimes very low to the ground sometimes coming very very close to people I mean, close enough where people could reach out and touch them. Uh, just amazing accounts. I've had incidents where they paced vehicles. I've had cases where they've gone uh, into moving vehicles and into people's homes or open windows, then floated around in the house and went back out the window. In some cases, they went right through the walls of the house or the structure. And uh, they're amazing. And we had one really interesting incident. One of my research associates, Jim Brown, investigated April 6th. So this is just a few weeks ago. And this is up in Fayette County, which, you know, we talk about a lot on, about Fayette County. So Fayette is right on the border, certain aspects of it, certain parts of West of uh, Fayette is right on the West Virginia-Pennsylvania border. And um, this occurred in the afternoon. And according to Jim, and the whole report's on my website. People can go to it and read it on my website. But anyhow, they were doing yard work. And about 50 feet away that afternoon, they observed this what they thought was a mylar balloon drifting about 10 feet above the tree line or fence line moving toward them. And as this thing is getting closer to them, um, it, get, it's, it looks very bright white. It suddenly gets very bright white, and it looks like it's reflecting the natural light, and then it appears to be shining on its own. And about two seconds later, the witness said it exploded, at the same time, they described like a small lightning bolt that shot from the explosion to the ground. The explosion sounded like a small firecracker followed by a snap like a spark. And that spark part of the small fire. And um, so Jim gets, and they're looking all around. And uh, anyhow, Jim is the researcher. He gets out there within the hour. And this guy's a high-tech guy with a lot of good quality equipment. And they searched everywhere around that area. There is no residue of any type. So if we've ever seen any of these type of balloons break up or, of course, firecrackers, there was no residue whatsoever. This thing just disappeared. And uh, so it's another fascinating case, whatever this thing was. Wow. Yeah, I saw that when it came through um, on your on your page. And that, that uh, you know, you're hoping for ground trace evidence there but it just didn't sound like there was any no and that's what mystified and and jim is a very serious researcher he's open-minded but all very skeptical so he likes to have data and he was just 
amazed that there was like no type of residue where it was. I mean, this was right in front of the people in daylight at very close range. They both watched what was happening, and there's nothing there. And um, and it, and again, in so many cases like this, these things disappear. They go right through the walls or whatever. And there's a lot of even weirder reports with these spheres of light from around the country. You know, as we've talked in the last few years, I started investigating them get back in the '60s, and in in past years, from Pennsylvania and from many parts of the country, we're hearing more and more reports from Bigfoot researchers and Bigfoot witnesses in areas that have a lot of history of Bigfoot activity, that they're seeing these spheres of light low to the ground. Sometimes they approach close to some of the witnesses or researchers, and uh, then they're gone. And uh, so it's another part of the mystery, and there seems to be some connection between these spheres and the Bigfoot phenomenon as well. And, and as you might recall, you know, we talked about the 1973, that massive outbreak here in Pennsylvania that my team's investigated. And that's when we uncovered a lot of very strange things that we never even considered about Bigfoot, with UFOs and Bigfoot seen together at the same time and place, and these little spheres are showing up. And then we had that one really interesting case in September of 73, north of Pittsburgh, where two witnesses observed that tall, seven, eight-foot-tall, hairy Bigfoot with white, uh, matted, dark, uh, d white, uh, matted, dirty hair, but as it's running across the road towards the woods, it's carrying a small sphere of light in its hand. And a short time later, an object came across the sky and projected a beam of light down on the woods where the creature ran into. So um, it's a lot of fascinating things out there we, we just don't have answers for. Now, uh, Stan, we have a, a new host that I want to introduce you to. Her name is Jessie. And uh, she is a very avid field researcher, and she's been doing a lot of research into Dogman. Um, have you had any of these reports of the small orbs of light that also are in relation to the Dogman phenomena? Uh, I know that there have been cases over the years uh, where some of the Dogman reports, uh, where the history of Dogman reports another phenomenon, and, and these orbs of light have been reported. And, you know, it, I think the Dogman reports are not a, a really something new. Uh, if you go back and read through my Solid Invasion book about that massive 73 outbreak, we had, you know, hundreds of UFO sightings going on all year. And then we had that massive outbreak in the summer of 73, went on for weeks and months in the 74. It was making a lot of uh, local and statewide news. And we were out there day and night with our teams investigating the cases. And um, if, if you look at what I was talking about, there were a lot of your so-called typical Bigfoot reports. So you're seeing these tall, hair-covered creatures, six to nine feet tall. But then there were some variations of some of the reports. Some were shorter and more muscular. Some were taller and thinner. But there was also some reports where people were extremely close to these creatures and described the face as more dog-like or wolf-like with the big fang-like teeth and the glowing red eyes. And uh, some of those cases were just amazing. I remember uh, the one case occurred very early morning. I think it was around 3 in the morning. I have to look at it before it up. But this, this lady was visiting friends. So this was between um, Greensburg and Jeanette in a very rural area at the time. And this place where she stayed, which is no longer around, it was a very low foundation. And early in that morning, she got up to go to the restroom. And she's sitting there, so the window is directly in front of her, directly in front of her. She hears these odd sounds outside, and suddenly this thing raises up and is looking in the window right into her face. And, I mean, she's describing the skin, the, the nose, the, the fang-like teeth, the, the head that's more like a wolf, the glowing red eyes. And basically she was hysterical, and she ran, ran out of the room screaming. Um, they called the state police. The state police connected her to me. They sent a trooper out. They found some possible tracks out there. She was so frightened that she made those people take her to her home several hours, several minutes, several miles away. Excuse me. Here's the kicker to the story that a lot of people have never heard this before about Bigfoot. And I have more than one case like this, but it's not that common. Within the hour after she got to her home a few miles away, the same or similar creature showed up at her house. Wow. See, we've uh, all all three of us here. We've um, we've looked into the phenomena of uh, 
something following you. Yeah, um, uh, it's commonly called now the hitchhiker phenomenon. And you really touched on that in Silent Invasion before it started really coming out lately. Um, I think you mentioned that long before anybody else did in that book. Um, but now it's kind of coming to the forefront with Skinwalker at the Pentagon that more people are talking about experiencing this following that's going on after they start to investigate these things or they have experiences with these things, that they follow them back home and they start having experiences like that. Do you have any more examples of that happening? Yes, this phenomenon that we're dealing with is so complex, it is so bizarre. Uh, I don't think anybody understands it. I think the government is aware of it too, but they don't have the answers either. Um, and again, you know, what I what I was uncovering back in the 70s and, and many years since then, right up through the last few years, these incidents are ongoing. And they're probably much more common than any of us realize. And they're so strange. I, I said years ago, the phenomenon is so strange that it protects itself. Because unless you experience yourself, who's going to believe it? And there is just so many strange things going on with the whole phenomenon. My, and uh, it's just amazing. But... Uh, yeah, I've, I've been aware of this for a long time. Um, there's other cases, again, where um, in that case we talked about previously, you know, the, apparently the Bigfoot followed the witness home right after it happened. That's one example. But there's a lot of other things, too. And, it, again, being so complex, but one thing I found, I deal with these cases regularly. I mean, continuously, regu on a regular basis, on current and past cases I've interviewed. Can't even tell you how many thousands of witnesses I've interviewed. I've, this is 63 years of research for me, and I've never personally seen a Bigfoot or a UFO, even though I've seen a lot of evidence over the years. But the one thing I have noticed is this one. You can be at the right place at the right time and have a UFO or a Bigfoot or cryptid encounter. However, there's also a group of people out there, and I've talked to many, many of them. I've talked to a number of them in recent weeks have contacted me, and there are certain individuals that have had a long history of having encounters with well, the paranormal, with Bigfoot, with cryptids, and they started when they were very young children. And some of these cases, they had missing time. Uh, a lot of them, when they were very young, they, they lived in what they called a haunted house where they had paranormal experiences or saw ghosts or apparitions. But as they went through life over the years, they had encounters with UFOs, some with Bigfoot, other cryptids. And then some of these people I'm in touch with, uh, later their children had experiences and then their grandchildren. So something that's apparently uh, generation to generation. And it, it's just amazing. I mean, I could put 10 people in a room that don't know each other, ask them to write down some of their experiences, and you would see the similarities and the patterns of some of what's going on. So it, it's very, very complex. And, and I've, I've always wondered trying to study the background of people with limited time and availability because you can spend your whole life doing this, and pretty much I did, but I worked full-time and had a family, and you're limited to what you could do with so many cases coming in. But um, it may well be that certain people have certain abilities. They're able to perceive the phenomena that other people may not, or it may well be that the phenomena is attracted to certain individuals that have certain abilities. And then there's some incidents that maybe other people that don't have these capabilities, being in close presence to somebody that does, they might experience something at the same time. It, it is so bizarre. It, and, and the things I found out about Bigfoot over the years, because I went into this believing Bigfoot was probably an unknown type primate. So I've been investigating Bigfoot sightings in Pennsylvania since the 1960s. And what I knew about then I thought they were some type of unknown animal until these reports began to come to my attention in the, in the 70s and ever since then. And now we know, whatever these things are, that they're much stranger than some just unknown species of animal. One thing that I really, really love about how you conduct your research is that you follow the evidence where it takes you. You don't ascribe a narrative to anything, and if the information changes, you kind of go with it. Um, have you received any pushback in particular uh, by using that kind of methodology and, and going in that direction rather than committing to a, a narrative of any kind, whether it be a, a UFO, paranormal, or Bigfoot narrative? What Have you received pushback from that, and how do you feel about that? 
really, I, I can't say that. I mean, one thing I've always been very careful with is that, you know, I, I always, from the time I started, and, and, you know, for years and years, I had teams of scientists and engineers and research people and police officers in my research groups. And we looked at these things very open-minded, and we always tried to find a logical explanation for the incident before we'd say it's something unusual. And I, that's what we do today. And many reports coming in, they're explainable. You get Starlink satellites, you get reentry of space debris, you got uh, stars and planets, you get conjunctions, uh, you get uh, hot air balloons, uh, Chinese lanterns, um, those type of things are just things that look strange and unusual we're able to track down. But um, there are cases every year you could not easily explain away. But just like with the Kecksburg UFO case, I mean, I've started investigating that from the time it happened, 1965, and for years there were certain details that I never discussed until I had enough uh, independent confirmation from enough people that could, could, could confirm that particular aspect of it. And, um, but again, you know, a lot of the, what we're dealing with now, I mean, I had a lot of good data from the 70s and since then that indicated we were definitely dealing with something. There were things showing up that people didn't know about, they couldn't read about at the time. They were telling me similar things. They were observing certain things. And um, and it, it, it began to be very apparent that whatever we're dealing with was something much stranger than an animal. And um, as reluctant as I was to talk about it, I, had, I was not going to sweep it under the rug because I knew from talking to many researchers back in the 70s across the country and out of the country that a lot of these other people were aware of these cases, but they weren't going to publish it and they weren't going to talk about it because they were afraid of being laughed at by their peers. And my position was, I don't know what's going on. I've never seen one, but there's something definitely happening here, and I'm not about to hide it. We need to find out more about what's taking place, and that's what I've always done. That's wonderful. That uh, that there is yeah, that yeah. is the best way to approach the subject, in my opinion. Well, yeah, a prime example of that is uh, something that uh, an incident that Stan, you're familiar with, with me and Ron, because we had, we worked with you on this case. Um where we went out to a sighting report and Ron packed along his uh, Geiger counter. And uh, we, we wished we had brought the trifield meter because what the Geiger counter was doing, but we, we were picking up residual uh, radiation in the area and it was unexplainable. This was supposed to have been a Bigfoot sighting. And up to this point, I entertained some of the ideas and possibilities just it purely honestly based off of your work uh, and, and how in-depth some of your cases were in your case files. So uh, it, I entertained the idea that there could be something else with this phenomena or something linked to this phenomena that is of a more um, unexplainable nature. You were and very I was, uncomfortable. Yeah, uh, it, I was uh, forced into a paradigm shift. And yeah. since that time, we've now replicated uh th that environment let we'll say this the environment has now replicated itself three times in uh in different locations so we're not seeing like a consistent um every time we go to a reported area or an active area we're not seeing the same kind of evidence but there are certain reports that we are getting these strange readings um these anomalous readings that did 100 percent force a paradigm shift for me and um i'm not sure if, uh how familiar you are with uh, ron moorhead and uh, the quantum bigfoot theory um but i can see where a lot of this stuff ties in at that point where there there is this to me i, I can see there is a very much flesh and blood creature of some sort there but also that there is something that is of another category altogether. And uh, it, it's, it's one of those things where, to me, like I'm seeing these two separate things, right? And I, I see the, the evidence that leads towards something that is normal and boring, but exists. It's just very unusual and strange. And then another that is similar to that, kind of a uh unusual and unexplained creature but just behaves on a completely different scale you know where you're seeing these disappearing 
creatures. You're seeing something phase out of existence in front of you or see something change its form or like you had uh, ex- like the report that was sent into you about the creature that was carrying the ball of light ran into the woods and then a beam of light shot out of the sky into the forest. That seems like just outlandish when you really think about it. But when we're going out and we're actually collecting scientific hard data, what do you do with that? You can't ignore it anymore. And, and again, that's what you're hearing more and more about uh, in, in the books coming out from other researchers, the same thing. Um, I, I've, I suggested, I believe, to you when this happened, if you have that Geiger counter, take it out. It's something very few people are doing. But yeah. more importantly, check the magnetic fields in the area, especially if you can get there quickly after the incident happened. Yep. Uh, I think that's very interesting as well. Uh, there's a lot of things. There, there's something that I found, and, and others have reported, but it's very rare with Bigfoot encounters, are the electromagnetic effects. And, you know, we've heard these stories with low-level UFO sightings going back to at least the 1950s of instances where these large unknown objects were hovering right over top of vehicles or pacing cars, and when they were in a close proximity, the motor would begin to sputter, they would lose power, the headlights would dim, the object would take off, and the power would come back on. Well, it's very rare, but the same thing has happened with Bigfoot encounters. So we've had incidents where these creatures are walked out in front of vehicles and the same thing. They, the motor began to sputter. They began to lose power. As the creature moved off, the power came back on. And uh, that's just one point of so many things. You know, before the pandemic hit, I was doing a, a lecture called Strange Aspects of Loose of Bigfoot, and I was getting a, a great response from it. And I had some skeptics in the audience. Some of these people, I remember one guy, I think it was a physicist, came up and he said, he said, you know, I've been always skeptical of UFO reports and Bigfoot reports. And said, after hearing what you brought through, the information you brought through, he said, this makes some sense. And what I found is that whatever we're dealing with, with the UFO phenomena and Bigfoot and many other cryptids from finding more and more, is that for a lack of a better term, it may well be interdimensional. It's a phys- it has a physical and non-physical component to it. And just like with Bigfoot, sometimes these creatures look completely physically solid. But as I mentioned, going back to the South Invasion and even more recent years, sometimes these things are more misty, foggy looking. You can see the whole shape, but they're not always solid. Sometimes part of the body is solid, and other times you can, they're out of focus, or you can see through parts of the body. And it's the same thing I hear from people. Sometimes people see these things that suddenly appear in front of the vehicle, and the whole time it's physically solid. But in other cases, these things appear out of nowhere. They take a few steps, and they disappear, and they're gone. And I've had other cases where people have watched these things, and it was just physically vanish and reappear a short distance away at another location. And, again, let me stress this. As I mentioned this in my, my new book, it just came out. A lot of this stuff I bring up more and more, some more and more cases like this, which are so strange. But, and I lost my trend of thought. Okay, one, we do not know where these things are or where they come from. That doesn't necessarily mean they're extraterrestrial. UFOs may or may not be. I said years ago, from the patterns I was seeing, it may well be that there's more than one origin to the unknown category of the UFO phenomena. And the fact is that maybe a small percentage might be ET in nature, but again, look at the similarities. And, and this is something you're hearing more and more in the Pentagon reports, the Navy reports in recent years. These objects can suddenly appear. Sometimes they look physically solid. They can suddenly disappear or change form. I've been talking about that for years and years, and we have cases like that in recent years in daylight where these things Huge objects in daylight I've investigated in recent years, large cigar-shaped objects in some cases. They're physically solid. They're low above the ground. They begin to slowly vanish away and disappear, or they physically change one form into another, and then they vanish and they're gone. And this is something that's going on more and more. And then you look at the similarities with some of the cryptid and Bigfoot cases, and you've got very similar type of things being reported. There's something going on here, and when you read um, – some of the books have been out in the last few years, and you, you read the similarities of all these different researchers and all what we've been covering. It's all very similar, and uh, it's just fascinating. And the other thing is, too, you know, again, while you can have sporadic sightings anywhere, there appear to be certain locations around the country, and there's several in Pennsylvania, and I hear them from all over the country now and out of the country, 
where this phenomenon, whatever we're dealing with, seems to target. So whether it's the people involved or the property involved, some of these places have a long, long history of having paranormal phenomena, Bigfoot sightings, the small spheres of light, UFOs, uh, mysterious footprints, screams and howls. You go on and on and on to all kind of anomalies, but it's just amazing. And, I mean, even in recent weeks and months, I'm hearing from people in some of these properties where they're having the balls of light blow the ground. They're hearing screams and howls. They're having Bigfoot encounters. It's, it's going on, and I'll bet you this is going on much more commonly than we ever hear about because how many of these cases don't we even know about at this time? Absolutely. Um, I would like to pivot back to kind of the investigation side of things and the tech side of things. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the Seth Breedlove documentary, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, was that photo of you standing in front of all of your equipment on your shelf <laughs> behind you. Um, and I really, really enjoyed hearing about and, and reading about how you use the technology of the day during the 7374 flap to really use it as a force multiplier. You coordinated your teams via radio. You use the latest technology of the day. And I'm sure you've advanced as technology has advanced. Is there any kind of technology now that it's easier to acquire, cheaper to acquire? Um, is there any kind of tech that you're really, really excited about using today during an investigation? Well, there's no doubt there's a lot of equipment now available that wasn't in 73. I mean, yeah, we had, uh, with my electronics background, we set up a pretty elaborate radio communication center in my home. That was our headquarters, and I set up a two-way radio dispatch system so we could dispatch some of the investigators out to the areas, and that became very important during that massive wave of 73. And um, But back then, a lot of the equipment, night vision equipment, uh, we did have access to radiation equipment uh, and uh, survey meters, things like that. But um, a lot of the equipment we had to build. So you've got to remember, I had some pretty good techs and engineers and scientists in my group, and we built some of our own equipment. And um, that became very helpful. But now a lot of this equipment is more and more available, and it's – much, much cheaper than it used to be over the years. So at least yes. today researchers have access to a lot more uh, instrumentation they did back so many years ago. You know, it's uh, it amazes me looking back at the history of, of this type of research and how, um, I guess you would say how easy we have it today in comparison to having to actually create actual uh, detection like measuring devices, having to create your own uh, hardware essentially from scratch. I mean, luckily you guys had Radio Shack. <laughs> yeah. We we don't any. Well, West Virginia has one. We've got, I think, the last Radio Shack on the planet, I believe. But <laughs> it's it's still here. Um, but finding finding that kind of equipment today is way easier, and the having the equipment. And going out and purchasing it, to me, is a totally different world than where you came from, where you you built the equipment. You didn't just, like, know how it worked. You engineered it to work. And uh, whereas, you know, today we're just picking up a piece of equipment. Oh, yeah, this piece does this. This piece of equipment right. will, will detect a, a certain field of energy, and this piece of equipment can detect temperature changes. Whereas you guys had to engineer that stuff on the fly and make it. That's just phenomenal. Well, I'll tell you, it's just been a, an interesting journey, uh, how things have changed over the years. But the fact that we've learned so much more, and yet there's so many unanswered questions. We don't know what we're dealing with. And again, the, the more I know about the, whatever we're dealing with, the stranger it is. And, um, and you know, we're talking about those electromagnetic effects. Well, something else, too, and, and you – uh, on your end, you folks may have come across this too. Uh, and more and more recently, even when we went back to digital cameras, and, and I believe even film cameras, but now digital cameras and now with the phone cameras, there have been many people who have attempted to try to get pictures of these objects, even in daylight, and a camera which had worked perfectly fine prior to the observation would malfunction exactly at the time they try to take a picture. And this has been reported with cryptic cases as well. And, um, and something I also found now is that in some cases, 
after the cryptid encounter. So we're talking not just Bigfoot. We're talking Bigfoot. We're talking Thunderbird sightings. We're talking out-of-place animals like Black Panthers, which are really intriguing. I get into a lot of that in my new book and my past books and some of the weird cases I found with Black Panthers and the connection with these strange places where the phenomena is going on uh, with Bigfoot connections. Very, very weird stuff. But anyhow, even after the initial encounter, where there's some physical evidence, the person goes over to try to take a picture of the physical evidence, and the camera malfunctions. But when they get back to their home, everything's working fine. And uh, I don't know if you folks have tr- uh, come up with any cases like that or not. Personally, uh, I-, I have seen e- equipment drain. I've seen battery drains uh, on site. Uh, I know Jesse has as well. Um, Joe got to see some weird stuff at, uh, at one of the, uh, places we, uh, re- what, we, we, uh, we did an investigation last year, right, Joe? Was it last yeah, year? Yeah, it was, uh, 2021. Yeah, it was last yeah. year. And, uh, he actually got to witness some of that stuff. So yeah, there's something to do with it. And like you and me, we've talked multiple times about this and I think we're both under the assumption that this, whatever this is, it's energy based and, you know, uh, I think that that's pretty much all that we can agree on is it's energy based. We don't know how the energy uh, interacts. We don't know where it's coming from. Uh, we have no idea. Like you said, it could be multidimensional uh, quantum fluctuations. We just, you know, science is grasping for answers at this point, in my opinion. That's right. Well, the pattern I found years ago was that many close range, low level UFO sightings and encounters with Bigfoot, and some Thunderbirds and Black Panthers and other weird things that we get reports on calmly occur in the vicinity of energy sources. So they calmly take place around high-tension power lines, power plants, uh, cell phone towers, radio communication towers, bodies of water, um, let me think, gas wells, gas It goes on and on and on. There is no doubt in my mind. I noticed this back in the 70s, probably before that. And uh, that's been going on continuously, and there's no doubt there's connection. If you look into a lot of the areas where these things are going on, just look around the area, and I bet you'll find there's a lot of these energy sources around in many cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, one of those famous places that produces the energy was actually uh, Point Pleasant, uh, you know, the where the waters mingle, right? Uh, a lot of people yeah. do believe that that water is the source of that that energy. Like maybe the ions do that, and and maybe that's what caused uh, some of the some of the sightings. Because before there was the Mothman sighting, there was a massive UFO flap uh, in mm-hmm. that area. So, you know, and a lot of people think that it was related. Maybe it was, and I'm not right. saying it wasn't at this point because yeah, I don't rule anything out anymore. Uh, I've seen too much weird stuff to even. To even say no, it's not possible. There's there's just too many things. But yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that this is an energy based kind of thing, whatever it is. And speaking of that whole Mothman thing, uh, in your newest book, you do address a a uh, Mothman sighting that occurred before the actual uh, sighting in Point Pleasant. Yeah, that um, was really intriguing and. Uh... Yeah, I actually I had heard rumors around the time that I was making the news in Pennsylvania. I heard rumors going around the Pittsburgh area that something similar was going on, but I tried to track it down, and for years and years I, I heard rumors, but I could never find a source. But, again, over many, many years later, I did find a witness, and that was a, a first incident I heard about. So it happened also in Allegheny County outside of Pittsburgh. And um, it was a really interesting report. Um, I, I think I first revealed that in my uh, past book, Astonishing Encounters. Mm-hmm. I got into that in great detail. Yeah. So now in my new book, uh, another author I happen to run into who had lived in Pittsburgh for years, his name was Bill Davis III. He's written some really good mystery books. He told me about an encounter that his, his close friend had that he was witness to because this guy shied, showed up at his home uh, right after his date where this event happened. And it's a really amazing, intriguing story. And um, this would have happened, uh, I believe it was in the fall of 1966. And um, it, it's an amazing story where he goes on and talks about what he and his uh, date encountered uh, 
out that evening. And um, it has some very close similarities to what uh, we heard about with Mothman. So uh, it could well be there was something going on up here around the same time. Yeah, it is amazing. I'd suggest you guys get the book seriously and read it because you, you're going to you're going to think twice about the Mothman legend when you when you read that. Um, you know, I don't know. I think a lot about the Mothman legend myself, but that's you know that's for other reasons, right, guys? But um, yeah, uh, just this book is full of stuff. By the way, if you haven't read it, you go into a lot about. Uh, there's even a, a section here. Uh, about you know, like you said, the Black Panther phenomena. You you've addressed that. You went into um, the Thunderbirds. Like there's a huge section here about Thunderbirds. Like an amazing section actually about Thunderbirds. Um, just this. If people don't know what this is, this is your case books, right, Stan? That's what these are. These are actual cases. It's not. This isn't like a story. This is actual cases that you've investigated. Yeah, either most of them of case I was directly involved in or, or researchers mm-hmm. close to me were involved in. And, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing. These are the kind of things that go on all the time. You just don't hear about. And uh, and there's weird things in there. I mean, I, I go into things that people were reporting in the lakes and rivers of Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, with UFOs, you, you hear the Navy talking about these incidents where these objects are diving into the ocean. We've had reports here for years that these things going in and out of the lakes and lakes and rivers of Pennsylvania. Uh, so there's that infinity, affinity for uh, bodies of water as well. But I get into you know the whole section on the many UFOs and some great cases there, uh, the Black Panthers, low-level, close-range UFO sightings. But there's things in this book, I guarantee it, people have never even heard of before. There's some very, very strange and, and creepy Creatures. The name of the book, by the way, is Creepy Cryptids and Strange UFO Encounters in Pennsylvania. It is on Amazon and Barnes and Noble now, and uh, it just came out last month in March. And uh, I'm starting to get pretty good feedback from it, and um, people were very intrigued. But some of these cases get into the really strange elements of the cases that are showing up more and more. It just really indicates that we're dealing with some very, very strange things, and um, it's just amazing. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, you talk about Black Panthers, and, and we may have talked about this case, but what I found out years ago was that uh, Black Panthers, of course, we're talking about these creatures. They're commonly something you see in a zoo, not common in this part of the country, part of the world. They're generally what people think of as a black leopard or black jaguar. And, um, again, with these reports, in some of these cases where there's a history of ongoing phenomena – Sometimes, for example, uh, back in, let me see what my memory is, 1979, 1981, 82, on the border of Westmoreland, Armstrong County, near Apollo, PA, and there was there was so much going on. It made so much uh, news, actually, that it made the news. It was on Pittsburgh area television in a local paper with a major story about it. And this went on for months and months and years where – an, an ob- as I recall, an object fell one afternoon into a large wooded area, and after that, they began. The locals began to hear screams and cries and howls. They began to see those small spheres of light. They were then they were having an outbreak of Bigfoot sightings and an outbreak of Black Panther sightings in the same area, and this went on for for months and months, and just really really interesting type of report. But here was the case that I investigated. And this is the one that really convinced me that now we've got to look even further in this because it's so complicated. So this is February of 1983. So up in Fayette County, and again, we've talked about Fayette County many times, probably one of the most active country, counties in the country for phenomena, especially in Pennsylvania. And a lot of these areas are along the Chestnut Ridge. And the Chestnut Ridge, that mountain range would extend through – Westmoreland, Fenton, Indiana County, and Southwest PA, and extends down to a few miles outside of Morgantown, West Virginia. I believe that's Preston County. Has a long history, of basically year after year, of UFOs and Bigfoot and cryptid encounters and mystery booms and all kind of weird things going on. And um, it's year after year, but Westmore, Westmoreland and Fayette are really active areas year after year, including this year. But anyhow, February of 83. Cold morning, this guy gets home from his uh, friend's house around 1 o'clock in the morning. His car is overheating. So he pulls into his driveway, and he goes inside and grabs a can of antifreeze. 
He comes out. He's putting some antifreeze in the car, and he hears this loud growl. So he turns around about 20 feet away. There's this large house cat, uh, large black house cat, and it's sitting there growling at him. We didn't think too much of it because there's cats around the area. So he goes back to putting some more antifreeze in the vehicle. A few seconds later, he hears a second growl, but this growl is much more fierce-sounding and much louder. He turns around, and he can't believe what he's seeing. This thing now has physically grown about twice the size it was a few seconds, a few minutes before. And it he throws the empty antifreeze can at it and hits it, and the thing growls ferociously at him again like it's going to attack him. And it takes two or three steps backwards and growls again for walking up the road outside, which is all lit up. The guy runs into his garage, grabs his pistol. When he comes out, it's out there. But now this thing, he says, looks just like a, a full-sized animal, like a black panther you would see in a zoo, with glowing yellow eyes staring at him, growling at him. He took a shot at it. He wasn't sure if he hit it. And seconds later, it physically vanished and disappeared right in front of him. Wow. You know what's really strange about the people who, who uh, encounter these things that I found out? Uh, by reading your book, there's a, there's a really interesting one in there about uh, a giant spider. I'm not going to go into details because it was just it's terrifying. Uh, I'm afraid of spiders. So, but um, what's really uh, interesting about it is when these people confront these things, they do exactly what you just said. They tend to just disappear, vanish, or some other strange thing. It always led me to think when I read those, it's like it, it makes no sense. Kind of like you always said, it's. Uh, you know, it hides itself with its, with the obscureness and the strangeness of it all. But, you know, could it be designed to do that? Could we be dealing with an intelligence that actually is using some kind of uh, – you know, using that as a test almost to see if if uh, perhaps the person is kind of – how they're going to react, you know? Um, it, it always makes me wonder about that and, and screen images or the so-called screen image phenomena with uh, contactees and abductees. And uh, it's just, you know, it blows my mind when I hear some of these things. And it could explain, could explain, doesn't, but could explain how some of these things are perceived by some of these people and, you know, the high strangeness of it all. Yeah, and, and when you read some of the details in this book, I get into some things that I don't think most people have ever really thought about or, or even I knew, but I'm finding more and more of these cases now. I'm just beginning to discuss it a little more as these cases come to my attention, but – you know, I talk about the fact that in some cases we're finding that the immediate area where these encounters take place and possibly even the individuals involved are temporarily manipulated in various odd ways where the cryptid or other phenomena has taken place. For a better term, I'm calling it env environmental physical anomalies. And it's very, very weird. It, it's as though there, there's something changes in the, the local atmosphere almost as though are they somewhere else are, you, are they in another dimension are they it, or it seems as though sometimes whatever we're dealing with is able to manipulate the physical environment as it's taking place or in the area and i go into the book and i talk about some of the weird physical anomalies that have been seen up on top of the chestnut ridge for years and there's some very interesting pictures in the book and um and also, if you read one of the Black Panther sightings, a witness mentions to me that as they're watching this this Black Panther in the trees right above them, that the trees in the area, the branches, they weren't that thick. And it seemed as though at the time it happened, as though the trees may have changed, that they got thicker and larger so the creature could pass through them. And then they apparently went back to normal. And this is just his theory. He couldn't explain what was going on. It was just his theory how it seemed as though something may have manipulated the environment. It's very bizarre. Yep. Those are some of the, my favorite accounts just because of the sheer high strangeness. I mean, there really isn't anything high stranger than, you know, a possibility that reality itself or your perception of reality has been altered or changed. I mean, that's there's some technology from our what was that episode we did joe uh, not too long ago with the class of beings oh, right? the, the kardashev scale <laughs> yeah. episode. we were talking about the class yeah. uh class two class three symbols. yeah yeah exactly so yeah the, you know, that you're you're looking at uh technology levels that would be on on that kind of a scope yeah 
if it were something physical manipulating right. people that's what you'll be looking at the truth is we have no idea what it is but this and is that's, amazing that's stuff. one of my favorite things about the book too is that um you know stan you don't try to explain away or mm -hmm. justify any of these sightings it is just as you said earlier data on the table and you can take it or leave it here's the case file this is what we found this is the data and we have to live with that <laughs> that's it yeah and uh, it's, it's just again to me it's such an intriguing thing because when you talk to so many different people and and people call in and they think for a lot of these people they want to know if they're the only ones they don't, they can't believe what they saw many of these people it was their first encounter and they would never believe what they saw or experienced until it happened to them. And their lives were changed. Many of these people, some of these people I'm still in touch from 30, 40 years ago. And their lives are still different from the day that happened. And, um, you know, it, it does have an effect on people. There's no doubt about it. And um, one thing that was really interesting, one thing I bring up, and I, I think I just go into it very briefly in this book, but... We hear these cases more and more out in the western part of the country for whatever reason, but here in Pennsylvania, there are very few cases where witnesses claim that these Bigfoot creatures try to mentally or telepathically communicate with them. And, I mean, all of the handful of cases I had, these people were all credible. They were reluctant to even want to talk about it. They couldn't understand it. And, um, but there was one case that I was a witness to. So I can confirm this story. And this was back in the 1980s. I can't remember exactly what year. I'd have to try to look it up. And anyhow, this was um, out along the Chestnut Ridge. And my team had gone out because people reporting this Bigfoot creature was coming down from the ridge, coming pretty close to some of the residents at the bottom of the ridge and uh, scaring people and whatever. So we're out there interviewing a group of people. And one of the witnesses reluctantly said that, that they believed that this creature was trying at times to communicate with them mentally. While we were there, this person said, this creature is now telling me that tomorrow morning, so the next morning, there'll be a UFO incident over this little town. It's like 15 miles away in another county. And interestingly, early the next morning, over that particular town, this strange high-pitched sound caused a lot of commotion from the local people. The police went out, the fire department was called out, and actually was in the news the next day. Wow. That's a trip. But how do you explain that one? I can't explain that one. You know, is that the case where the guy, like, had the uh, episode, uh, or was that a different one? There was there was one case uh, that you were, you were on where the guy almost seemed to get possessed or something, I believe, if, if I remember. Well, that's a very, very long story. Yes. And that's why I wrote it up in Silent Invasion. I wrote the whole story yes. up. It's probably one of the strangest cases ever documented. It's been written up all over the world. Yep. But that was the case in 1973, October 25th, 1973. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the basics of yep. the story because it's, it's so intriguing. Um, it was October 25th. There were a lot of reports come in on my hotline, which I established in 1969 and report sightings, and it's still very, very busy with calls coming in. And uh, I got a call from a state trooper from the Uniontown Barracks in Fayette County, and uh, he had just came back from investigating this incident. He said he believed it was very possible there was something still up on the farm. He wanted me to get a team up there as soon as we could. So it was already late in the evening, but we did. We got our team together. It took us a while to get together. We got our our radiation meters, we've got our radio equipment, our other equipment, and headed up to rural Fayette County. Spent uh, pretty much the whole night and early morning up there. Um, the brief part of the story is that around 9 o'clock, about 15 people in that community and out in the country, they see this barn-sized red ball about 100 feet off the ground. It's hovering and begins to slowly move downward. And I always focus the story on the farmer's son who was coming out to visit his family, who lived on the farm, and as he's driving down the farm road, he sees the object, he sees people standing outside looking at this thing. So he decides to go to uh, a neighbor up in the hill to get a better look. And it looks like this thing is coming down, it's going to land in his dad's pasture. So there were two young boys up there, and they decide, the three of them, they were going to go see what this thing was. 
they end up going over to the, the dad's farm. He grabs a thirty odd six, which you know is quite a powerful weapon, mm-hmm. and a handful of ammunition. And uh, he didn't realize at the time he had two tracer bullets in that ammunition. And so anyhow, they're riding down the farm road, going towards the pasture. The dogs around the area are going crazy. They hear this high-pitched whining sound and these loud baby crying sounds. As they're getting a little closer to the pasture, the sounds are getting louder. They angle their truck, let the headlights on so they can see the path going up the hill, and they notice it looks like something's draining the power from the headlights that they had never experienced before. They finally get up to the pasture, and they're standing there looking over the field, and about 250 feet away, this object is now on the ground or right above it. So now it's not a complete sphere. It's a big white dome. So it's like a half a sphere, a big white dome, about 100 feet in diameter. So it's a huge object, again, right on, right above the ground or on the ground. And it's illuminating the area, making this high-pitched whining noise. And they're standing there staring at this thing, can't figure out what this thing is. But a short time later, their attention goes over to a barbed wire fence about 75 feet away. And along the barbed wire fence, are these two tall, air-covered, bipedal creatures, one behind the other, slowly moving from one post to the other along the barbed wire fence. The biggest one's about eight feet tall. One behind's about seven feet tall. They're moving very slowly, uh, very sternly, one behind the other. And these things are covered with long, dark, matted hair hanging off the body. They have no neck. Their arms are so long, they're hanging down almost to the ground. They're bipedal but kind of stooped. And they have glowing green luminous eyes, and they're making that baby crying whining noise. Well, the young one young boy is so frightened he runs out of the field, and the other one soon after starts yelling at the older fellow, "Shoot him! Shoot him!" So the guy takes his first shot. Well, again, he didn't realize that the first shot was a, a tracer bullet. He fires a tracer bullet over their head, no response. He fires that second tracer, and when it is when he fires it. The largest of the two creature makes a loud whining, crying sound, reaches out with its one hand as though to grab that tracer. And the moment it does that, that large object in the field vanishes and disappears. So it doesn't take off. It just physically vanishes. Most of the luminosity is gone. The loud whirling sound stops. The creatures turn around, slowly start walking back along the fence towards the woods. At that point, the fellow is firing live ammo from his 30 6 into the creatures and mainly aiming at that big creature. And he, he told me for years and years, he said, I'll never forget how that thing kept staring me with those glowing green eyes as of pumping ammo into it, and there's no effect on it whatsoever. So the two fellows, they got pretty shook up. They ran back to the truck. They went to the farmhouse, told the family what happened. They took him to the neighbors and called the state police. When, they, when the troop arrived 45 minutes later, he said, the, the witness said, just forget about it. You're going to think I'm crazy. And the trooper said, look, we had a report of two similar creatures up on the ridge the night before. I had to investigate the report. So they go up in the troop car, and they're going up in the field. They're looking for evidence. And, again, this is all the short part of the story. And uh, the trooper told me that when they got to the area where the object appeared was on the ground, the so- whole area was self-luminescent and glowing, about 100 feet in diameter. I believe he said – that that glow extended up, uh, I believe it was around uh, 10 to 12 inches off the ground. Uh, he said the farm animals would got, not go anywhere near it. He shined a flashlight beam into it. He could barely see it. But he told me, he said, if I had a newspaper, I'm almost certain I could have read a newspaper from the light coming off the glow. And, uh, again, making the story short, uh, they went back to the state police barracks. I was told that both the trooper and the witness were taken to two separate rooms, separately interviewed. Then they called me to send up my team. And when we checked the radiation levels, we got now it was several hours later until we got to the scene, but the glow was gone. The farm animals still would not go into the area. Uh, they were acting pretty odd, and the radiation levels was normal. And then things happened more, during the night that got even weirder and weirder, and we don't have time to get into it. It's just, it's just it's it an amazing a, story case that uh, clearly changed my mind of all weird and a lot of the skeptical research people in my group. But once again, we can't say this was extraterrestrial. We do not know. We don't, we've yeah. never known for sure mm-hmm. what the unknown objects are. So again, if these things can suddenly change form or suddenly appear and disappear, well, we're dealing with a technology that's way beyond anything we can comprehend at this time. 
Yeah, that's that's not wrong. Um, like we're we're looking at something, whether it is a technology or some kind of ability, or both, <laughs> that yeah. that we just we don't have an answer for. Yeah, uh, it's, it's you 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 mentioned you mentioned that you're getting reports. Um, I know on your website you post regularly when you're working on a case and you've got new cases presenting themselves. Uh, on an ongoing basis, um, many researchers, including myself, have experienced what seems to be an uptick in activity, and it seems like things are accelerating. Do you feel like that's what's happening right now? Is that to me the question? I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Yes, that was to you. Yes. Okay. Well, you know, as we previously mentioned, I don't understand why, but since October of last year and continuing right to January, and through the last few weeks, it's been nonstop. We're having a lot more activity than we normally do this time of the year. And it, it's not just lights in the sky. I mean, many of the reports, you can go to my website and read some of these cases, and a lot of these are low-level large objects. So we're getting reports of triangular objects, large cigar-shaped objects. Uh, over the years, we've had a number of reports of large, solid, rectangular objects being reported. We're getting the, the small orb, low-level orb reports, the mini UFO reports. So we are definitely getting a lot more activity than we generally should be seeing as, as what we've seen in past years. And I've been in touch with other researchers, told me they've been in touch with other researchers around the country. And in some states, they believe there's also been an increase in activity as well. Um, so uh, hypothetically speaking, uh, just this is me trying to – work some of this out in my head with the uptick in activity, trying to maybe pinpoint a reason. Do you think it might be because now a lot of the taboo has been lifted and there's there's a lot of uh, paranormal television, all, an abundance of paranormal YouTube, uh, tons and tons and tons of paranormal podcasts like ours, um, there are, there, there's no shortage of any of that stuff, uh, in, in today's era where, where we used to be kind of limited to what they ran on the sci-fi channel, um, with, with what our paranormal intake was. Uh, so, so it's, is it, do you think it might be because it's now less taboo that people are actually coming forward with these reports? So it seems as if there are more reports, or do you think that there is actually genuinely more activity now than there has been in past years? Yeah, I do think there's more activity now. And a couple of things. One, you know, no, uh, one is that um, a lot of the TV shows just started years ago. You've had a lot more uh, TV series talking about these phenomena. So I think that did at least encourage people over the years to be more um, willing to come forward. But – However, of the majority of people I talk to, which is a lot, even though they report sightings, majority of them want no publicity whatsoever. I mean, over the years, I get calls from men, women, and children, all kind of backgrounds, you know, from engineers and school teachers, police officers, pilots, all kind of reputable people, and they still don't want any publicity. Yeah, they uh, want the other anonymity. thing is, right. And the other thing is, many of the witnesses I talked to, even recent months in the last couple of years, they seem totally unaware. That the government is now has now opened up a new office to investigate sightings, and they're taking it more serious now. Most of them don't even know about it, so I don't think that really is having any great bearing on it. It's just the fact that they were in a situation where they saw something they, they could not explain, and uh, they wanted to see if somebody else saw something as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's something that I've been wrestling with for the last year because I've noticed the same thing that there's there's been an uptick in reportings. There has been an uptick in in different types of phenomena. You know, it's it's been a kind of across the board. You get a increase in Bigfoot sightings, increase of other cryptid sightings, in definite increase in UFO phenomena and lights in the skies and whatnot. So I, I didn't know if because uh, I've talked to other researchers too, and and they seem to think that it might be related to the pop culture phenomena and it's now really being embraced. And, uh, so yeah, hearing that from you, um, kind of solidified, I think where all three of us kind of stood, this stuff is actually on an uptick and 
uh, why is the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I gotta ask, Stan, you've been around for a very long time in this field. You've seen a lot of strange stuff. You've talked to a lot of people. We hear these stories from time to time of, you know, these uh, government harassments and whatnot, men in black, if you will. Uh, have you ever had any experience with, uh, with a men in black type situation or anything similar to that? Well, I have not had a personal encounter, but there were incidents over the years where mystery men showed up going back to the Kexpert case. And then really a lot, uh, I talked about some of this again in Solid Invasion, about 73, about some of the, the mystery men had showed up. Uh, one case, a fellow showed up, but it was important physical evidence that confiscated evidence and also destroyed evidence uh, at a Bigfoot sighting. Never found out who he was. Um, and, and then there was uh, other parts of the, of the mystery that you're talking about was more positive um, one of the things that I had mentioned um, back in 73 was during all these reports coming in and all the activity and all the cases going on and all the media coverage, and it was this amazing stuff. Of, of the many calls that I received, one call came in, I believe it was September, and this man told me that he, that he worked for the government. They were very much aware of the investigation I was doing and my teams were doing. Um, he provided me the name of a laboratory in Washington, D.C., the name of a contact, the address and phone number in the event we came up with a body or something that significant. And um, I have no doubt it was legit. And uh, but anyhow, as time went on, you know, there was so much. I mean, there was it was a near panic situation around this area for a while with all this activity going on. People were getting scared and. Um, you know, public safety was concerned about it, and people were calling their congressmen. And I did get a call from um, the office of one of the congressmen, and um, they asked if they could have a meeting with me. So two two um, people from the office came and paid to visit with me. I got to know them very well. We kept in touch for a long time. They were very supportive of what I was doing. I told them about the phone call I had gotten at that time, and they checked it out, and they found out that was a legitimate government number. Um, so anyhow, that was pretty interesting. But there were cases over the years I've had that involved both Big, uh, Bigfoot and UFOs. And can I say 100% it was government? I cannot. I can just say that there were some mystery men that showed up to seem to have quite an interest in some of these cases, which were very significant cases with physical evidence. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, you, you know, being here where we're located and uh, so kind of close to the Mothman uh, incident and all the men in black uh, stories that surrounded that. It's always interesting hearing more of that that took place outside of our region, so to speak. Um, and, and I know that we, uh, a couple weeks back, we'd addressed part of that, which sounds similar um, with the gentleman that was destroying citing evidence from the Bigfoot we were uh, Jesse. What were they, the the men in plaid? Is that what they were called in the conspiracy episode? Yes, yes. It's the men, yeah. it's the men in plaid. Yeah, the the men in plaid that showed up and destroyed uh, Bigfoot evidence at different sightings, and it sounds like that goes all the way back into the the seventies. And I can tell you, of all the years, I, there was only one incident happened. I think it was in seventy three again. One of the other investigators were looking into it. We could never never get any more data, but there was one report, and again, this only from memory, and it was very little, but it was so odd because they claimed it was a hairy creature with a torn jacket or a torn cover, and it was described the same way. It was a plaid shirt, plaid something he was wearing. It was wearing. So was this like a werewolf report, maybe? Well, is that again? It now it's hard to give a, a caption to this type of thing or say yeah. what. But you got to remember, you know, if you look at the Dogman reports, what people call Dogman now, you look at some of the cases I had in '73 where people were, were within feet seeing this creature that had fang-like teeth, wolf-like face, glowing eyes. Well, what would you call it? <laughs> a lot of people may have called it a werewolf back then. Yep. I mean, he's right. When I first heard of the Dogman phenomenon, I'm like, wait, are we talking about werewolves? You know, it took me a while to figure out, uh, wait, there's a little bit of a difference, but 
only slight. I mean, it almost seems like it was something used the werewolf imagery and decided to make itself in that image. It, I mean, that's literally what it seemed like to me. And, and Ron, you got to remember too, uh, you know, as we talked about er earlier this evening, when you looked at those cases in 73, for example, you had your typical Bigfoot report, then you had some other variations in the description. And now over the years, and again, not just from reports I've heard, but many other researchers have gotten reports of these creatures physically changing form, uh, balls of light, the small spheres changing into creatures, as weird as it sounds. You're, you know, hearing more and more about these type of cases now. Um, and then I had cases over the years where people were following trails of footprints that would change from one strange track into another type of track while they're following it. So what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with something that can change in any form it wants to? Is that possible? And again, it, you know, I keep repeating myself. I'm just telling you, the more we know about it, the more there's so many unanswered questions. We just don't, we just don't understand what it is, but it's going on. Too many credible people from widespread areas are reporting similar type of experiences. Yeah, 100%. I absolutely agree to that. And, and one other thing while I'm thinking here, Ron, you know, is the footprints. And I, I believe I mentioned that, and I think in this book I talk about a little bit, is the fact that you, you've got your typical five-toed footprints of Bigfoot. They've had them for years in Pennsylvania. But also in Pennsylvania, during that time, we had the three-toed tracks showing up. But we've also had four-toed tracks. And around the country, and if you go on the Internet and Google it, you can find a lot of information on this. For years and years, even the Pacific Northwest and other parts of the country, we have a history of Bigfoot encounters. You've got five-toed tracks. You've got three-toed tracks. You've got four-toed tracks. You hear about six-toed tracks. But you can't have so many type of unknown creatures. But at the same time, you've got so many, again, credible people seeing something, you can't just dismiss all the reports. There's got to be something else we're dealing with here. And here in Pennsylvania for years, we've seen footprints. I've made casts of some of these over the years. It's not just your so-called typical five-toed and three-toed tracks. There's other type of tracks that have shown up that are completely more unusual and different. But interestingly, at least similar tracks over the years from other parts of the country years later showed up. Again, you can't have so many types of unknown creatures out there, but <laughs> there, there's something out there and there's some evidence to support some of these reports. So we're dealing with something that's very, very beyond our understanding right now. I actually, um, we actually got a cast in North Georgia that looks very, very similar to your three-toed tracks. However, it's a four-toed track. And we cast that in the mountains of North Georgia uh, probably two years ago. So, yeah, I've, I've personally seen these tracks and cast them myself as well. Okay. And good. that's good to hear. And, yeah, again, there's, I've been aware of this since at least the 70s. In more recent years, I've heard many reports from many other researchers around the country of finding these tracks. It, it, again, it's been discussed on many shows from many other researchers and witnesses, and um, it's coming to light more. I mean, people are get, becoming more open-minded because I think a lot of people in the Bigfoot field are finally beginning to question what I asked years and years ago. If Bigfoot's an unknown creature, after so many reports across the country and around the world of something similar, why don't we have a body by now? And um, I think there's just – there's a lot of data now which suggests whatever we're dealing with, we don't understand it, but it's more than just an unknown flesh and blood creature. Yeah, there's not uh, – you, you know, and there's – you get into this whole different realm of skeptics at that point. But what, do you, what else do you do with the data? You can't, you can't just ignore the data. When there's actually real hard – not just physical – but actual readings, scientific devices that are being used, instrumentation that is is working and working normally, not not experiencing any kind of hiccups, mm -hmm. and you get anomalous readings. What do you do? You can't ignore that. The the data. One of the things I've been saying on here since we started Wild and Weird Radio is that the data does not care about your feelings, and and like I was telling you earlier, Stan, that was one of the things that I had to face myself was that the data did not care about my feelings. And so 
So I'm starting to uh, starting to lean into some of these other directions, and uh, you know, I, I agree with you that that there's some really weird stuff going on, and it it would answer the question behind why there's no body, but then we start getting into the whole answering a question with another question predicament, and uh, where do we go from there at that point? So what? Uh, as as we get ready to wind out, where do you think the future of of research into these various phenomena is going? Because you've been you've been in it for over sixty years now, and you've watched it evolve over the last half century. Where do you see it moving in the future? Well, I, I think from what we're seeing now, from what I'm hearing, from being in touch with many other, again, researchers, witnesses, what I've seen in the last several years from the new books coming out, from people on talk shows, from other researchers, is that they're starting to find that there is more to the Bigfoot and UFO field than just one explanation. You know, that these things have the abilities to, again, to suddenly appear and disappear, to physically change form. It, it's... It's something that's just well beyond our understanding right now. And I think you've, um, you're seeing even from the, some of the documents that have been coming out uh, recently, and, and there's been discussion about the, the interest in the government and the Skinwalker Ranch and similar type of things going on there, the ty same type of things we talked about in the 70s in Pennsylvania and now showing up around the country, that I think they're going to find more and more that there's, there's a lot more of this than anybody understands. And a lot of these various anomalies – may well be somehow connected to the same source of whatever that might be. Yep. I could not agree more with that. I mean, it's a very hard thing for a lot of people to accept, but, you know, uh, just from day one, I always said there's some kind of relation to these things, and it sure seems like that's where we're moving toward, that these things are related, and at least some aspects of them are. And, uh you know, I don't know that we'll ever find an answer. I always tell people that it's like when you get into this research, be prepared to never find an answer. You know that you may find an answer for yourself, but you're not going to find likely uh, this universal holy grail. Uh, you yeah, know, it won't be the answer. No, it won't be the answer. Even if we had aliens land on the lawn tomorrow and tell us, you know, they're from planet whatever. How would we validate that? How would we believe that to be true? Or, you know, it, it would open up another whole can of questions. You know, these these are phenomena that literally cause a spiral when it comes to uh, the way that we think and the way that we perceive things and paradigm shifts in general. I mean, one one answer will lead to a million questions. That's for sure. Well. I can just tell you, you know, my attitude towards this phenomenon has changed a lot over the years because, again, when I got involved in this, I started going out in the field in 1965 after the Kexpert case. And uh, of the thousands and thousands of cases I've been involved with over the years and, and the hundreds of Bigfoot sightings and cryptic cases I've been involved in, I, again, when I first got involved, I was completely convinced that Bigfoot was an unknown creature, an unknown animal. But as time went on, I had to go where the evidence led, where the patterns led. And, you know, I wasn't out there looking for these things. I wasn't expecting to find these type of reports coming in. You've got to remember, 1973, you know, the, the communication was much different than it is today. I mean, many people, when they saw something strange, they would first call the police departments or the news media. And luckily, back then, a lot of them would refer the cases over to my teams to investigate. And had it not been for all these cases coming in from widespread areas from different people telling us the same thing. And, I mean, we were out in some of these locations within minutes to hours after the incidents happened. And you could see the emotion of the people. You could see the animal reaction. You could see the physical evidence. You knew these things were real. And, and one thing I don't think we mentioned tonight, of course, one of the really unusual anomalies was the fact that we get to some of these locations. There'd be trails of footprints in all type of ground conditions, including even in fresh snow in the winter, and you follow these trails of tracks that would just abruptly end where there should have been more tracks, as though the thing just vanished and disappeared. That's been going on for years, including in recent years, all over the country and in Pennsylvania. There's no explanation for how some of these different incidents could be fabricated under the conditions we found them. 
Yeah, it's it's hard to look at some of that information and not go in uh, in a direction of some sort of extra dimensional um, extraterrestrial environment or right? involvement rather, um, especially with the prince that just end. Uh, so we are uh, we're coming up here against the end of the episode, Stan. Tell the folks where they can find you. Okay, well, then go to our website and check reports and information. It's Stan Gordon, G O R D O N dot info, I N F O. Uh, my, all my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Uh, if they want to get a lot of detailed reports about that 73 outbreak with a lot of the weird UFO Bigfoot cases, that silent invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot case book. Uh, Astonishing Encounters of Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures was the, the, the oh, excuse me, the book before last. And uh, the newest book is Creepy Cryptids and Strange UFO Encounters of Pennsylvania. It's got a lot of very interesting, intriguing new reports in there. And uh, the, these books are highly recommended, guys. If you are listening to our show, you will absolutely love these books. Stan, again, we cannot thank you enough for joining us for a second time folks if you want to listen to the other episode go back to uh the the archives over on the website or in any podcatcher and just type in stan gordon you're going to find that episode uh that we've recorded with him in the past so stan again can't thank you enough you're fantastic we love your research thanks for joining us always thank you so much all right. Well, thanks for having me on. Congratulations on your hundredth uh, program. Thank you, Thank my you. friend. Thank you. We'll be talking soon, my friend. All right. Have a good evening. All right. Thank you. Bye. Take care, man. Night. Guys, you heard it tonight yourself. You heard some of the stuff that we constantly grapple with, trying to figure out energy these strange phenomena are they related can they be related is it aliens is it extra dimensional it wasn't just us saying this stuff this time yeah so uh, you two i know you you've you've always had an issue with this because uh you know that that's legit you had a problem with the possibility that there may be something more to uh this than just a flesh and blood creature right yeah, yeah you know part of it had to do also with the fact that like at one point in time i actually cared about being taken seriously mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, like part of um part of that had a lot to do with that was the uh there's a lot of researchers who will just straight dump mm -hmm. on you mm -hmm. for for taking that approach and yeah. i was trying with you know we were in the fledgling years of our endeavor and trying to trying to win people over from certain camps and then just gave up on that crap. Cause... Yeah, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's no point. There's... Like you said, yeah. it doesn't care. The data doesn't care, guys. And if you want to really get into it, grab some equipment, go out there. This is replicable by anyone, yeah. by the way. Jess, you've proved it. You yeah. guys, you hit the trail, you go out there, and you have verified it. You have seen the same data. You have seen the same strange anomalies that we have and that other researchers have, too. We may not be the cool kids, but by God, we have got the same results on a lot of these things, and we're in different areas. Yep, absolutely. Um, I, I gave a presentation at Wild and Weird Con last year about basically how to just get started and go into the woods and start doing this research yourself. So, um, you know, anybody can do it. And I always encourage everybody to go and do this research yourself. Um, even if you start small, go and check it out. Because if you don't believe us, will you believe your own eyes at this point, you know? So um, just go out and do it. That's that's my biggest piece of advice, even if it's just a little bit at a time. No, I agree, 100%. That, I mean, seeing or and hearing sometimes is believing. And sometimes you'll just think you're crazy. Yeah, it's uh, you get a lot of that too. I mean, you you see this evidence in front of your face, and you're just what? Le like, what do you do with it? You, well, you, you, heard you just record it. That's the best thing you can do is record it. You you heard catalog it, it yep. and and hold Observe it. Observe and report. Yep. Observe, hold report it until and verify. you see it happen again. Then mm -hmm. you reference it back. You know, it's that's yep. where it becomes so valuable is having those data points. 
where you can look back and say, these were the observations made on this day. It's just these are it the observations made today. What did they have in common? What things, and that's that's where we can start coming closer to to having some form of, not an answer, but at least seeing patterns. And the if, direction. Yeah. If we can start to see the patterns and connections to some of these phenomena based off the data that we're retrieving, then yeah. we can run around in a bigger circle. It's true. <laughs> Rather than run around in tight little circles, yeah. losing our minds. Well, the more stuff we throw away, you know, that's data we're throwing away. There's no point. Absolutely. In yeah. And and sanitizing data and sanitizing reports for the sake of uh, credibility right. is, is just so I'm over it. I'm over yeah, it. Yeah, here's a newsflash. The scientific community thinks you're crazy and nothing will change Never. the <laughs> mainstream scientific community's mind about you being a crazy person. Absolutely. So, um, just let it go, let it go and, and go. And Are you going to sing? Up. Are you going to sing for us? No. no. <laughs> oh, I was hoping that she would break out into let it go. Oh, nope. well, maybe in the future episode, maybe on the 200th episode, we'll get Jess yeah. to sing for That's us. That's it. Probably not. Jess will serenade you. Song. It won't be a Disney song, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would get sued, but that's um, okay. Maybe we can make up our own generic song. There you go. There, there you go. go. There we go. Jess, was, why don't you do your thing for us? Not fine. Okay, guys. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And a huge thank you to Stan Gordon for taking the time to talk to the Wild and Weird crew. Um, make sure you go and check out his books. It's absolutely required reading if you want to get involved in any of this, do any of this research. Um, he is the man when it comes to the Chestnut Ridge and Pennsylvania high strangeness and weirdness. Again, his website is stangordon.info, and he actually has a 24-hour UFO Bigfoot cryptid sightings hotline that you can call in and report if you have any sort of sighting, or you yeah. can email him, and all that info is on his website. Again, it's stangordon.info. Uh, make sure you pick up his latest book, Creepy Cryptids and Strange UFO Encounters of Pennsylvania, Bigfoot, Thunderbirds, Mysteries of the Chestnut Ridge, and more, and this is his fourth case book. Uh, make sure you get Silent Invasion, which is my personal excellent. favorite. Yes, it's an excellent read. The illustrations are amazing. Everything is really, really just it. Like I said, it's required reading. Required reading. You can read them, get through them in an afternoon, and read them again. There so, may be tests. We don't know. <laughs> there may be tests. There's a quiz. There's a quiz. Um, but yes, thanks again, Stan Gordon. We really appreciate you coming on and uh, just uh, chatting with us and. Um, my name is Jesse. I run Hellbent Holler, and you can find me on YouTube at Hellbent Holler, or you can find me on Instagram at Hellbent Jesse. Uh, the gentleman with the glasses over here, that's Ron Lanham. You can find him on Instagram at Lanham Ron. The buddy with a hat up there, that is Joe Purdue, and he is under Skinwalker Sculpts on Instagram. And you can always find all things wild and weird at wildandweirdwv.com. Make sure you join the forum, uh, join the Facebook group, have a little chat with everybody, and uh, share some info. And as always, like, share, subscribe, and turn on your notifications for the show. Uh, if you are using a pod catcher, I suppose that's what they call them, make sure if you listen to the podcast, also download it, because that helps, helps us go up in the numbers. So do that little favor for us. Like, share, subscribe, turn on your notifications, all that stuff. Little housekeeping there. Got to do it. We really appreciate everything you all do. And um, thank you for joining us again on another successful episode of Wild and Weird Radio. And remember. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you don't like, share, and subscribe to these episodes, we will hire one of these men in black to have you restrained to a chair. And no. force you to watch no, 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 all no, 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 100 no, no, episodes no, 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 of no, no, Wild and Weird Radio no, no. on repeat until we reach episode 200. I can't stop it. That does not sound <laughs> like a kink that anybody wants to get involved with. <laughs> so like, share, subscribe, folks. We appreciate you. 100 episodes, baby. Woo! Stay wild and weird.
Welcome to Wild and Weird Radio, Wild and Weird West Virginia podcast. So this is uh, this is the first episode, um, the inaugural episode of Wild and Weird Radio, and this is each one of our origin story by the camp. So today we're covering Mothman fact and fiction. Today, your hosts are your resident Sasquatchologist. The most recent news that came out last week from the Pentagon. Yeah. Today, we're covering cryptozoology as we cover the Flatwoods monster. Tonight, we're covering a broad range of paranormal topics with our good friend Dave Spinks involving possible interdimensional beings, paranormal activity, and just general high strangeness. I don't know how else to even explain it to you, but I no, think there's a I'll lot of people out there. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there who are experiencing things that they uh, typically don't, don't see, I think. Is, uh, and these are all depictions of what they think, or what they say, came from the stars. We're interviewing the legendary Mark Marcel with the Olympic Project member Shane Horst, who finally have Mr. Ron Moorhead with us tonight. And this week, we are celebrating our one-year anniversary show. Hey, everybody. This is our first launch into video where you can see every one of us. All you got to do is hit the record button, and it starts recording. I'm recording myself right now for Wild and Weird Radio. When I'm not sitting at home or when I'm driving down the road, I listen to Wild and Weird Radio. That's one thing you can send in to us if you want. But Ron Ron came across a really good uh, background and that, that ties into the mythology of these that goes in uh, into the realm of ancient astronaut theory. Yeah. Imagine that. Ron's going to tie this into aliens. <laughs> But it's no. there and it's very prevalent. So Whoa. I'm surprised, Ron. Ron, you've caught me off guard. <laughs> My mind is blown. I know, right? Leprechauns. <laughs> I mean, we're going to be doing this forever, right? Forever, right? Before we sign off tonight, you guys know that Wayne Barnes was very important to this show. Um, he was our third co host and he was the probably most open-minded person that, that, that we had had with us. Uh, he could have had, he came into the show and had a lot of his own thoughts about something. Began to experience things in a different way and began, once he started researching, to actually get more open-minded and looking at these possibilities of all things wild and weird out there and made the show better. We're going to miss him dearly. He was a brother, and after he passed, we, we kind of fought like in ourselves what, what was going to go on, how this was going to look moving forward, and Ron designed a, a new rebranding for Wild Weird Radio, and we are moving forward because that was one of the things that Wayne told us when he first got sick, was that regardless of what happened, that he didn't want us to stop doing what we were doing, that he wanted us to keep going forward wanted us to keep pressing on with the show and keep the show going um, because this show meant a lot to him it, it was a weekly getaway from, from everything else just like it is for all of you guys and us it's our, it's our little hour and a half getaway from, from all the chaos in, in life and uh, we appreciate that you let us be a part of your life and that you let us be a way for you to escape some from from all of the chaos that's going on around you and you, you listen to the things that we're talking about and the research and you've come along with us on this journey and rest assured we are moving forward wild and weird radio isn't going anywhere anytime soon we're here to stay and in memory of wayne we're going to be stuck around here for a long time we will probably be midweek uh, or, or closer to Friday, but that'll be regular starting after starting with this episode. So whatever day this episode drops on, it will drop the following week on the same day. Uh, we're just ironing out a few kinks. So hang in there with us. I know we've been gone for a while, but we are back and we are not going anywhere. I can anywhere. guarantee you that 2022 is going to be our biggest year yet. Welcome back to Wild and Weird Radio, everybody. Uh, we are your hosts, 
Jesse, Ron, and Joe. We are hanging out with you guys today. We have a great topic lined up. And we really, really appreciate you guys being a part of that. Uh, so make sure you go over to wildandweirdwb.com and check out all the new stuff going on with the guys. And um, I think that's it. Other than you better like, you better share, you better subscribe, and you better tell everybody you know that is into the weirdness of the world about Wild and Weird Radio. So guys, got anything else? Joe, you well, want to threaten any kind, of, uh, <laughs> any kind of baby Bigfoot or anything like that? Go ahead, Joe. Stay wild. Thanks, guys. <laughs>